that gets called of God to preach the gospel, there are two things that need to happen. Number one, he needs to be set under a seasoned pastor, a seasoned teacher of the Word of God, a man that has deep thought, deep rooted, and he's grounded and he's settled in the Word of God. He needs that. Needs that bad. I didn't get that. Secondly, he needs to find him a good Bible school, and he needs to be taught in the Word of God. Now, the reason I say he needs a good pastor is because if you go to seminary or whatever, or some of the Bible schools you'll go to, and you don't have a good pastor to teach you, and you're grounded and rooted under him, then you can be led, led astray because some of the professors do not preach or teach the truth in all your Bible colleges. Right. They just don't do it. Now, if you take a young preacher and you just call to preach and you put him out pastoring somewhere, I mean, you might as well just go and shoot that cat between the eyes. Okay. He has had the lick. That bunch will eat him for breakfast. Promise you. They will absolutely devour him. So every young preacher, and the, especially the church, ought to, to have knowledge and wisdom of saying, young man, you've been called of God and we love you enough that we, if we can't give it to you here, we're going to find a church and let you go to the church that's got a good, sound, doctrinal preacher and we want you to go over there and join up and you sit under him and you let him give you some guidance and some teaching and some ministry. Right. right. I'm giving you good advice. Right. It's true. I didn't get that. I got saved, called to preach, and I mean, by that, that, that was in the winter and summer, I had got a church and was pastor. If they just hadn't been old and loving saints, they would have killed me, and I'd have got discouraged and quit and backslid and went back to the house. Promise you that would have happened. That's what's happened. That happens to a lot of young preachers, right? So Paul is taking Timothy and he has spent the time with him to minister to him. Now he has left him at Ephesus in this church. But there's problems beginning to take place in the church. And Paul hears of these problems. Probably Timothy even told him about some of these problems. The other saints that had told Paul about some of the problems. So he sits down by the Holy Spirit of God and he begins to pen a letter and write a letter to Timothy saying, Son, you are going to be in trouble if you don't stand upon the truth that I have taught you. This is what I want you to do. Now let's look back at the 18th verse, then we'll get to the 20th verse. He says, This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecy. Now, uh, prophecies are teachings or preachings which went before on thee that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. Now, he says, the word of God that you have been taught and what I have preached unto you, I, these things that have gone before you and you've received these things, he said, this is what I want you to do. I want you to use these things so that you might fight a good fight. So that you might war a good warfare. Uh, I talked with a young man that got saved recently. And he said to me, he said, I am so messed up. And I thought to myself, well, you're not the only one. And he said, you know, I don't understand what's happening. It's, he said, it seems like there's one part of me that is in darkness and there's another part of me in light and said it's struggling one against the other. I said, son, you saved. And the light of God came into your life and it's trying to shove the darkness out and the darkness is trying to shove the light out. The light is the word of God. The darkness is the power of Satan. He, I said, no wonder you're in a mess. He said, now I know what's going on. <laughs> Man, that's 
a revelation. You say, well, I knew that. Yeah, but to that new Christian, he didn't know. And if he had not got to not only me or to someone else that knew, he was to the place of getting discouraged. He just going to throw in the towel. He said, I wasn't like this before I went to church and got saved. I don't know what's wrong with me. Well, that's the way it's supposed to be. That's just part of it. So he tells Timothy. Then we expounded a lot last week on the 19th verse. He says, holding faith. <clears throat> now, of all the things that we as Christians think that we have, faith is at the top of the list. Right. And how do you get faith? Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. He's instructing Timothy, you preach faith to these people. You teach faith to these people. Timothy, don't get sidetracked. Hold on to your faith. What is the faith? Jesus Christ and Him crucified for the sins of the world. The other things that I have taught you, taught you doctrinally about the Word of God, you hold to your faith and hold to a good conscience which some have put away concerning faith have made shipwreck. Now there was some in the church that wasn't doing right. There was some in the church that was teaching not according to the gospel, but they were teaching things that did not line up with the Word of God. So he says, hold to your faith because there are some of them in the church Man, they're just like the ship on the sea. They have shipwrecked. And their lives are becoming a mess. Now, the Bible, if everybody has an opinion on it, and I'm sure everybody does, but it does not make your opinion right. And it does not make my opinion right. What makes all of us right, if we can read it in harmony and in unity of the Spirit of God. Now, this is the problem. The Bible is a spiritual book. It was spiritually given. And it takes spirituality to discern it. Now that's the reason that God gave and placed gifts within the church. He called preachers. He called teachers. Now those people have a particular gift that other people don't have. What God does through His Spirit, He will reveal and give insight into the Word. And through His Spirit, as that man looks in the Word, the Spirit of God will begin to reveal and show him things maybe you don't see, maybe you've never seen. And then He teaches and preaches and expounds the Word. And it's like an artist painting a portrait. He begins to paint and he begins to teach and before long you begin to see the picture. And you look at that verse and you say, oh, now I see what it is. Now I understand that. But now you think, if everybody in this church was called on ever, say on Sunday morning, we'd just start in right up here with Bonnie and go uh, right down the line and tell you, all right, you're going to preach. I'll guarantee you we would have a mess. <laughs> because there would be no certain sound. The Old Testament said, how do we know how to go to battle unless the trumpet gives the battle call? So there's got to be a certain sound in the church. And the sound is, through the gift of God, through the Word of God, through the Spirit of God, and the same Spirit that lives in me lives in you, and when the Word is expounded, then it begins to make sense. You begin to say, whew, I didn't know that. Now I can see what you're talking about. I can understand why I'm going through the things that I'm going through. So he says, holding faith, having a good conscience, because some didn't hold to faith, and they got shipwrecked. So the church in Ephesus is typical of a lot of churches because of not that they didn't have proper instruction. Now they're fixing to get it. They're going to be instructed right. Now comes the 20th verse. 
and whom is Hymenius and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Now that's a confusing verse by itself. And I, I've heard preachers preach, said, all right, you get saved, and if you don't follow into the doctrine that, uh, that you started in, then you'll be delivered unto Satan, and you'll be lost, and you'll go to hell. That's not what that verse says. Now here's the question. What was going on in the church at Ephesus that Paul named two people in the church, called them out, and said, I've turned them over to Satan. Why did he turn them over to Satan? I want you to go to 2 Timothy. I want you to look in the second chapter. 17th and 18th verses. But now we're fixing to do this whole chapter. But I want, I'll want i show you why that you need to look further than just one or two verses. In the 17th verse of 2 uh, second, uh, second Timothy, 2nd second chapter, 17th verse. And their words will eat as doeth a canker of whom is Hymenius and Philetus, and concerning the truth have erred. Now, Philetus is the same person as Alexander. They said, Paul said, they have erred. When they err, they mean that they're not talking truth. They're not saying what is true. Now, what was they saying that wasn't true? saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. So here was the problem of the church at Ephesus. These two characters were standing up teaching in the church and got their little groups together in the church and saying, hey, the resurrection has already come and we've missed it. Now what did it do? It caused faith. The people that had believed that Jesus was the Son of God, that He had saved their soul, and that He was coming one day and going to take them to glory, it was destroying them. I mean, they was, they was in a mess. It'd be just like you. If I came to you and said, hey, the resurrection's already passed. That'd be terrible, wouldn't it? Why do I want to go to church if the resurrection's passed? Why do I want to read the Bible if the resurrection has passed? Why do I want to give tithes and offerings? Man, I might as well go get me a, like uh, our president, drink beer and shoot a game of pool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if the resurrection's passed, we're just wasting our time. Yes. But there was a problem. Now, he had said, that he had, Paul said, I've turned these two, I've delivered these two over to Satan that they might learn not to blaspheme. Well, how do you turn anybody over to the devil? How do you deliver them unto the devil? We're fixing to find out. Second chapter, I want you to look at the 11th verse. 11th verse, 2nd chapter, 2nd Timothy. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also, also live with him. Now, that's what all of us have experienced. Mike and Debbie, after they got saved, Mike especially went home and dug him a grave and he buried Mike out back. You're dead with Christ. Mike we're is dead. Together. Yeah, we're, we're buried together. Just as Jesus Christ, <laughs> just as Christ died and resurrected, when he saved you, you died, that old man died, and you were resurrected just as Jesus. You are a new person in Christ Jesus. 
You're not that same person. So keep that uh, in mind. We shall also live with Him. We not only live with Him in us here, but one day we will live with Him in glory. <clears throat> Twelfth verse. If we suffer, we shall also reign with Him. If we deny Him, He also will deny us. So when tribulation, trials, burdens, these things come, you know what? It makes me know that I'm a child of God because I wouldn't be suffering persecution and trials and tribulations if I wasn't a child of God. Right. So if we suffer with Him, we'll reign with Him. And if you're not going through any persecution, you better check and see who you follow. Because it's certainly in Jesus Christ. Thirteenth verse, If we believe not, yet He abideth faithfully, He cannot deny Himself. Now notice this. Just because people don't believe in Him does not nullify that He is. That's right. He Amen. is the Son of God whether we believe it or we don't believe it. He doesn't, that doesn't remove it or take it away. Before I ever believed that Jesus was the Son of God, He was. And because I didn't believe it did not make it so. But when I believed that He is the Son of God and received that, then it became alive to me. But yet there are millions and thousands of people that still don't believe it, but it doesn't make them go away. Amen. All these teachings. Amen. 14th verse of these things, put them in remembrance. Now what things? Of these things, put them in remembrance. So He's telling us there are some things Timothy, that you need to remember. There are some things, the church at Ephesus, that you need to remember. What are those things? Jesus is the Son of God. That He died and shed His blood for our sin. That when we ask Him to come into our hearts, He saves us. Our name gets written in the Lamb's book of life. One day He will split the eastern sky. He'll be the voice, the shout of the archangel, the trump of God shall sound. Then we which are dead and remember Oh, in our graves, we will rise. We will get our new glorified bodies along with the living. We will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Remember. Remember these things. It's all he's trying to teach you. And then he says, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. I'm a word man. <laughs> I like to just look at words. But words can be confusing. So he says that we should be careful about just picking out one word or two words or three words and trying to build a doctrine or a teaching on it. That's why that our learning and our doctrine and what we believe must be the entire Word of God, not just fragments of it. I can go through the Bible and pick out fragments and prove any doctrine that you can come up with. I promise you that I can. But that wouldn't be truth. It'd be misusing the Word of God. Now, what were they doing here? They were taking things out of context and they were teaching unsound teaching that the resurrection had already passed. He said if you do that all it's going to do is confuse the people that hears it. Now I promise you you get up, anybody can come in and preach a false doctrine and it wouldn't shake me in my belief in Christ. But to a person that had been saved a week, two weeks, month, three months, six months or a year, it might shake them because they're not grounded and rooted and settled in the Word of God. That was the problems going on in Ephesus. So he says you don't need to, to be striving about words, arguing about words, fussing about words. Have you ever been in any churches that did that? All it does just cause confusion. I watch people, I hit the door. I'm not going back there anymore. Woo! Is he off base? 
All it does is call strife. Just stay in the Word, preach the Word. This is good. 15th verse. Study. Talking to the preacher now. Talking to Timothy. Talking to a young saint of God that had been called to preach. Paul had taught. Study to show thyself approved unto God. Now, I should never, and no preacher should ever study to show the congregation, I know more than you. That's not what it's about. The man of God needs to study so he can show himself to God that he has God's approval. That's what it's all about. I think I may have told you this, but listen to it again. I preached in Annapolis, Indiana, and I had preached the masterpiece. First time I'd ever preached on TV, and son, I had a good one. I mean, I thought they would call me from all over the world and want me to preach that message. I was blowed up worse than a toad from I mean, I had huffed and puffed because it was, I mean, it was great. And there was a people telling me how good I was when they walked out. You like, don't you like to be bragged on? Mm -hmm. Well, don't brag on preachers, son. They got enough ego by itself. You brag on them, it really gets them out of soul. And everybody's telling me how good I was, and I already knew how good I was, and how great I was, and where I was going to be lifted up to. And a little old woman come out, she was doing that, that shuffle walk. <laughs> And then, I'll never forget her words, she took me by the hand and got up next to me and she said, keep preaching, son. You'll get to where you can one day. <laughs> you talking about a deflate, son. She stuck the knife in, twisted it, and let all the air out. And I thought, well, you old helper, you, you don't know what you're talking about. You wouldn't know good preaching if you heard it. You just heard the best. That's what he's talking about. It makes no difference if I can come and speak over your head. I've had preachers to do me that way. It makes no difference if I can give you theological reasoning about everything if you don't understand what I'm saying. So let me study so that God can approve. I want God to approve what I'm saying. I don't want it to be my words. I want it to be God's words, and then I can have the approval of God. Amen. If I preach anything outside this book, then I will not have the approval of God. That was the problem in the church at Ephesus. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman, that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now here it comes. He says, if you study, preacher, then you won't have to be ashamed before the people, before God, and you can rightly divide the word of truth. Now I explain what it means to rightly divide the word of truth. Later on. All right, you're not going to lay it on me. I'm going to lay it on you. <laughs> rightly dividing the word of truth is you can take the word and you can say what these two people are teaching is wrong. What Paul preached to you is right. You can take the word of God and say what's wrong and what's right. Rightly dividing the word of truth. You know what truth is. You know what untruth is. Now he's fixing to come down to some untruth. But he goes back to the fact you need to know, and you, you'll know when you study, you'll be able to divide right and wrong. 16th verse. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. Now if everybody comes and everybody teaches and teaches a different doctrine, and they just blabber, 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 Man, you did, we're just going to all be messed up. We'll have to close up shop and have to go to the house. Will you agree? Yeah. yeah. Got to be one voice, one mind, one accord, one God, one faith, one baptism, one word of God. So he says shun that stuff. 
and their word will eat as doeth the canker. Now he names the two characters. Hymenius and Alexander. Now tell me what canker is in the Bible. Is that a sword? Well, maybe. What is it? It conquers, it turns green. All right, you're getting the, you're getting the right color. <laughs> Come on, think about it. The word canker is interpreted gain green. What happens when you get gain green? Well, what will it do to you? I mean, he said that if you're not abiding in truth, you better look out because untruth will be like gang green inside your body. Now, whoa, he's not talking about the individual. He's talking about the church, the people of God. If whatever I do will affect you. However I live will affect you. How you live will affect me. Well, it won't bother me. Yes, it will. Because people will judge me by what you do, and people will judge you by what I do. That's right. right. So he's saying, you cannot let this thing go on. They're preaching that the resurrection is past. And if you let this thing go on, it will be just like gangrene. It will absolutely devour you. Amen. Now it's starting to be making a little more sense, isn't it? He said, I've delivered them unto Satan. I've delivered them unto Satan. Now he says, study and show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed what? Rightly dividing. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, what is truth? Has the resurrection passed or is it already passed? The Bible said that there would be the voice, the shout of the archangel, and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are that we remain alive will be changed and caught up to meet them in the air. Well, that's a truth. And the untruth, the lie is, the resurrection had not passed. These cats was teaching a lie. Now what do you do with a liar inside the church? Sean, get rid of him. We're going to cover that in a minute. If I cease to preach truth to you, then you grab me by the nap of the neck and you throw me as far as you can and say, get out. Because I'm not, I don't deserve to stand where I'm standing if I won't preach truth to you. Because if I don't preach truth, then you will listen to me if I preach a lie and I can lead you astray. And that's what was happening. Now I could come every Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. And I could preach on smoking, cussing, drinking, homosexuality, and adultery. I could get me five points. And I could hammer it every week. And every one of you would say, makes me feel pretty good because I'm not doing any of those things. <laughs> In fact, you'd be like me in Indianapolis. You'd poach up like a toad frog. It would make you feel like you're better than what you are. But when the Word of God's preached, it deflates so that it can build up. It takes away the fleshly part and builds up the spiritual part. So they had that problem. The resurrection had passed. Now I'm going to read the rest of this real quick and show you why. Nevertheless, the foundations of God stand as sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are His, and let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and earth, and of some unto honor and some to dishonor. Now keep that in mind. 
in a great house, a mansion, there are two different kinds of vessels, silver and gold, and wood, and what else? Earth. Earth. Some of them are made to honor. What does the word honor mean? Elevate. To be used. To be used. 21st verse. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet, the, and meet for the master's use, and prepared every unto every good work. Now, gold and silver are the most precious things that we know as a human being. But everything else is made from wood and dirt. Where did we come from? Dirt. dirt. Our pews come from wood. Now, if we allowed garbage and filth to be brought in and smeared on the pews, who'd want to sit on? Nobody. But if we cleaned them and we washed them and we made them as pure as we could make them and they smell good and they look good, then they'd be of use, wouldn't they? If I came in greasy, nasty, dirty, stinking, bad breath, bad odor, how many of you'd hug me? <laughs> About the time you get that close, you'd say, ah, oh, not me. I'll do you the same way. The nose goeth before the entrance. <laughs> Man, you're right. But if I cleaned up, you might hug me. And if I cleaned up, you'd allow me to preach. That's what he's saying. If you want to be service to God, then we need some cleansing. First of all, we need the blood of Christ. But after we get the blood of Christ's name written in heaven and become his children, then we need to constantly, when we sin and get dirt on us and stink and filth, we need to go back to God, not get saved again, but get forgiven of those things that we've done asking. That's why we stay in fellowship with God. Amen. Oh, man, that's a good girl. I'm going to get done here in a minute, I promise you. I've got five hours of preaching on this one verse. 22nd verse, flee also youthful lust, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart, but foolishness and unlearned questions avoid knowing that they do gender strife. And the servant of the Lord must not strive. That means to be quarrelsome, to be argumentative, always wanting to come down on you with a hammer, tell you what you're doing wrong, and you try as hard as you can, and you do something you think, I've really done good, and here comes a man of God, and he squashes you. He says, don't be that way. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient. I struggle with that in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. Now here it comes. He said, Timothy, if you hold truth and you preach truth to them, peradventure, what does that mean? Maybe, maybe, maybe God, peradventure, will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. Now he says study so you can rightly divide the word of truth. Be gentle with them. Don't be mean to them. Don't be harsh to them. 
you love them, you take care of them, you give them truth. And said, so just maybe, God will convict their hearts and they will repent. Now, why do they need repentance? He's still talking about these two fellows. Why do they need repentance? 26 verse. And that they may recover. You've got to be covered before you can get recovered. Maybe they can recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. devil who are taken captive by him at his will. Now we're starting to see what happened. Young people that had got saved, had got in the church, and they were novice, and they began to teach that there was no resurrection, that it had already passed. So the problems was that it caused a lot of people in the church to lose faith in God, of saying, you know, if, if the resurrection has already happened, then we might as well throw in the towel and go on to the house because it's not going to work. That's a snare of the devil. Amen. Snare of the devil. Paul was trying to instruct Timothy, get them to the place, give them truth, be gentle with them. Now, I haven't always done that. I've roughed some people up spiritually in my life. I mean, I've dropped the hammer on my son. You've probably been around preachers that have done the same thing, have you? Bow that back, man, I'd bow up. I would charge. I thought that's what you're supposed to do. But let me tell you, love hides, covers a multitude of sin. If you hadn't got that, folks, it'll never work. Now let's go back to the 20th verse and we'll, we'll hush. It names these two characters. He said, I've delivered them over unto Satan. How did he deliver them over to Satan? just what we studied in 2 Timothy. They had error. He was rightly dividing the word of truth. The resurrection had not passed. The resurrection was still in the future, was still to come. So he delivered the, their attributes, their message, and what they were teaching over to the devil. And he said, so that they might learn. So that they might learn not to blaspheme God. You can't take that one verse and make a doctrine out of it. But you can take that one verse and do a lot of teaching, can't you? Yeah. All right, let's take it. 